All right, so we got a shift in Revelation tonight after we had wrapped up the, the seven letters to the churches. We're going to see some uh, different things and some a lot more things that are hard to interpret, I guess you could say, as we get deeper into Revelation. But tonight we'll be in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. It's Revelation 4, looking at the whole chapter tonight. So the book of Revelation opened up with John having a vision of the Son of Man. That is Jesus. And he was told to, to write of things that he had seen, things that are, so things that were going on at this time that he was writing the letter, which was around the 90s of AD. And also to write of the things that will be. And we'll see in verse 4 and 1 tonight that this is where the shift's happening. So now we're going to be looking at the future very soon and what's to come of our earth. Uh, what's to come of heavens? What's to come of mankind in general. So we've been, again, just wrapped up the seven letters. So Jesus gave this to, to John to give to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And we saw that the churches represented churches throughout the ages and churches that, you know, exist right now. And he offered many invitations and warnings throughout that. So today, the vision, you'll have another vision of, of God. And this vision really shifts to heaven this time. And he looks at the things that will be. So, the future. Revelation 4. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones. And on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures gives glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. A vision of the throne room of heaven. So he talks about a door in verse 1 being open to heaven. And we see the other descriptions of doors being open uh, throughout the Old Testament. You have Ezekiel seeing heaven opened up. At Jesus' baptism, the heavens opened and the Spirit descended upon him. And Peter had a vision after Pentecost that a sheet came down with all types of animals for indeed. So heaven opening up was a big deal. You're seeing something new, some kind of revelation given to you. So this door being open, he hears a voice. He says, it sounds like a trumpet. And this is probably the voice of our Lord, Jesus Christ, saying to him, come up. And we see that it's soon going to be shifting to the things of the future. Because one, uh, this kind of hinted it in chapter 1, verses 19, about the things that will take place. And that's clearly what he says here. Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. So this is the future of the church. What is going to happen to the church? And John says that he was in the spirit. So this was really more than just a dream. It wasn't a pinto bean dream as we say <laughs> This was a, a real vision. It was a supernatural vision. And we know that all true prophecy comes from the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit, he was in the Spirit and being revealed this truth to him. And he saw a throne. In a throne, obviously we think about a king. A king who has rule. 
It shows rule. It shows authority. So this throne on it was sitting God. This is probably God the Father that he's, he's seeing in a vision here. So he doesn't see him fully. He's kind of, uh, in a way, shaded by the lights and the things going on around him. But he sees this throne as one sitting on the throne. It's just amazing to him. And we see a similar vision of heaven in Isaiah chapter 6. And he sees the throne room. And he also sees more with the angels that we'll talk about in a moment. And you know, throughout scripture and throughout our lives we find that satan has counterfeits for pretty much everything that god gives us that god reveals to us and if you remember when we were in chapter two and looked at the church in pergamos they had the throne of who satan in pergamos so you know it's kind of a counterfeit and we'll see later on in chapter 13 of revelation that the beast will have a throne of power but with the one who truly sits on the throne is god and we'll see this is a great comfort knowing that God is on his throne in heaven. He is in control. And how did uh, John describe God? In verse 3, he talks about, he says, And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Absolutely brilliant. Just beautiful. Really indescribable. And see, John uses natural things to describe the supernatural. Things that really are indescribable. How in the world could you describe what it looks like to see God? You can think about even the sense when you look at a beautiful sunset. You can describe some of the colors, but can you really get across what you're looking at? The beauty of what you're looking at? And he's looking at a heavenly vision. You see, it looks like Jasper. And this is probably what a, a diamond that he's referring to. And Sardius, which was more like a red ruby. And then we have a rainbow around the throne. And this rainbow is in the color of, of an emerald. So it's probably very green in appearance. And around the throne shows God's glory. But also we're reminded of God's promise. The promise to Noah. That he would never flood the earth again. And it's interesting how the rainbow has been hijacked in our modern culture, isn't it? Yet again, we have counterfeits over and over again. But the rainbow was a symbol of, of promise, and it does show God's glory on the throne. And I mentioned this just a moment ago, but this passage is really should give us comfort because we see that God is on the throne. That shows that the world is really not out of control. It seems like it's out of control, like we don't know where it's going to go at any point. But see, Revelation gives us the sum of it, that God wins. And God is in control. He has a purpose in allowing everything that's playing out to play out. And we see that he gives John this vision of heaven that's really a vision of comfort before he shows him the events that are to come on the earth. So knowing that God is in control is a great comfort when he starts to talk about the judgments that will come upon the earth. And now we're going to get into verse 4. It talks about some thrones around God's throne. 24 elders who are described as having white robes, golden crowns, and they're around on their own thrones. So they're involved in rule in some manner. It seems like they're part of the, the royal family there. Who are these 24 elders? Well, some speculate that they are angels. But angels are never described as having crowns anywhere in Scripture. And if you look back in 1 Chronicles, it talks about having 24 priests. So some say maybe this is some kind of exalted man uh, that is around the throne, these priests there. The dispensationalist view, which believe that there's a, a much bigger difference, and there's, there's lots of variations of dispensationalism, but the church and Israel are very separate in their idea. And from a dispensationalist view, they think that these 24 elders are, is just the church. It's not Israel at all. But I think the more likely interpretation is that this is the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles represented around the throne. So this is all of redeemed people basically being represented around the throne. It was not a coincidence and the Jewish people definitely understood that when Jesus chose 12 disciples, he was pointing back to the Old Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel. So we have 12 and 12 making 24. Now again, this is speculation. We don't fully know who these 24 elders are. Are, but I believe that they are representing the, the redeemed. I think that's the most obvious interpretation of it. And then in verse 5, he talks about proceeding from the throne are lightnings and thunderings and voices. 
Does this make you think about anything from the Old Testament? How about Mount Sinai? They were afraid, weren't they? They heard God's voice and they saw these thunderings and lightnings that didn't want to approach the, the mountain there. And this is what he sees coming from the throne. And he's not describing the fury of nature. You know, nature is very powerful, isn't it? You see these storms and the things they can do. It's amazing just with wind what it can do to your house. So what these, this lightning and this thundering and these things were doing is really showing God's power, but also showing God's wrath as well. And this wrath that would be poured out upon the earth very soon. Also around the throne. So he sees this just awesome vision. These lightnings and thunders and voices. And it says there's also in verse 5. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne. Which are the seven spirits of God. You remember seven is a number of perfection. As we look into Revelation. This is the Holy Spirit. Right there. Around the throne as well. So. The Trinity is just all throughout Revelation, all throughout Revelation. And sometimes it gets confusing about if it's the Father, the Son, or the Spirit kind of interacting in these various, um, these various parts. But this does appear to be the Father, and the Spirit is around the throne. And then we'll see in uh, chapter 5 next week that the Lamb takes a scroll. And we know who the Lamb is, Jesus Christ. So the Father, Son, and Spirit there. And also around the throne, there's these four living creatures. And before the throne, so there were these four living creatures, but before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. Now this description is before the new heavens and new earth. In, ver in chapter 21 of Revelation, we see that there's no sea in the new heavens and new earth. It's going to be a very different environment from what we live in today. It doesn't mean there's not going to be any water, but there's no sea in the natural sense. And he's not talking about a sea of water here. This glass floor is just talking about Something that's clear, that is holy, that is perfect. This is holy ground that this throne is upon. This is holy ground that, that John is approaching. And on this area, in the midst of the throne and around the throne, were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. Four living creatures. What are these? Probably angels. Now, I imagine this probably does not look like the angels you have hanging on your Christmas tree every year. You know, often we have this depiction of women in long white robes with wings. Did you realize that there's never a female angel mentioned in the Bible at all? Also, the wings are not always attached to an angel in most descriptions of angels in the Bible. But it seems to be some different orders of angels. And this is probably what they call the cherubim. Or you would say cherub for a singular. C-H-E-R-U-B-I-M. Cherubim. So a, a special order. And I imagine if you saw this angel, it probably would terrify you. <laughs> because it does not look like the peaceful angel bringing the message to you. It has all these eyes and all these wings and unusual faces. But, and cherubim are actually described throughout the Old Testament as well. We also see uh, seraphim as another type of angel. And there seems to be some similarities between those two different types of angels. But we see in the book of Psalms that the cherubim... Are around God. So God dwells in the midst of the cherubim. And also in Genesis uh, chapter 3 at the end. When Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden. Guess who's there guarding the garden with this flaming sword? It's cherubim. Yet again. And also when in Exodus when they receive the instructions for the Ark of the Covenant. They were to design cherubim. So you've probably seen pictures before. Or if you've seen Indiana Jones <laughs> before. That the Ark. Those wings over the top of that was with the cherubim. And that lid of the ark was basically the, the footstool of God's throne. So God's throne was in heaven and it was like his feet were touching the earth at this point. Also, it's described that in the temple they had lots of paintings, uh, engravings, and things sewn into the curtains of cherubim as well. So this was some a, a big image all around and in Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10, we see very similar visions to this. And this may have been the seraphim, but there's definitely very unusual angels described in Ezekiel as well. And here in Revelation, it says they are full of eyes in front and in back. Now, does this literally mean that they have eyes all over them? Yeah, we don't really know. But it's probably implying more about their knowledge, their perception, their awareness of the things that are going on. Now, angels are not described as omniscient. That is a character trait of God only in knowing all things. That's what omniscient is. 
But these angels, they were very, they could perceive things. They were very alert to what was going on and what God had for them. And in verse 7, he goes on to describe these um, living creatures as if they were not terrifying enough with all of these eyes. And later we see the wings. They have different faces that he describes. The face of a lion, the face of a calf, and some translations say the face of an ox. So a lion, calf, slash ox, the face of a man, and the face of a flying eagle. Now, what do these represent? You remember, apocalyptic literature is very sim symbolic. Lots of symbolism in it. From the lion, there's lots of things that have been presented as possibilities. You know, showing strength, showing power, showing that they were noble or majestic. So strength, power, noble, majestic, the lion. And then the calf, or it could be the ox, showed the humble service to God. Also that they were strong and faithful. So humble service, strong and faithful. And then the face of a man, that they were rational, that they were wise, that they were intelligent. Mankind made in the image of God is very different from the rest of creation. And then also one like a flying eagle. And that one really mainly says that they're swiftly fulfilling God's word so they can get go around quickly, flying eagle. And also you could think about the flying to heaven aspect too. But it describes these angels here as in the midst. And some interpret this as that these are not really angels, but they may represent God, Jesus in particular, around the throne. And there are variations of this saying that the lion is the lion of Judah. We know Jesus is the lion of Judah. And that as a calf, he was the sacrifice for our sins. And that he is the son of man. He's the, the new head of mankind, the son of man. And also the eagle describing him ascending back to heaven, that he is from heaven and can enter into heaven. And again, these are just, you know, different interpretations presented. We don't really know fully, but it's difficult with apocalyptic literature. And maybe their original readers had a little more reference point that they could understand these things. I believe that the descriptions of strength and humble service and rational, swift feelings, probably the right interpretation of that, but you, you don't have to hold me to that or anything. In Ezekiel uh, chapter 10, when it describes the, the angels there, one thing that's interesting is when God's presence, the Shekinah glory as it's described, when it left the temple, guess what was around it? What was around his presence? These cherubim, these angels leaving with him. And now isn't it interesting to think that he left the temple and here he is in the throne room of heaven with the same picture, these angels uh, around him and worshiping him. They also were described as having six wings with eyes and in and out of these wings. In Isaiah, he has a similar vision of angels. I think his are seraphim particularly, but the six wings are described as covering the eyes so they can't look upon God's glory fully. And covering their feet and being humble and also two wings to fly. So this is a description from Isaiah. And we see very similar to Isaiah as well. That there's constant praise coming from these angels. Holy, holy, holy. Verse 8. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Who had the hymn running through their head when they read that? <laughs> holy, holy, holy. That... Uh, Repetition there is called the trihagion, I believe is the pronunciation. T-R-I-H-A-G-I-O-N. Trihagion. And it represents God's independence. Now, listen to this. We have a lot of things from God, attributes that he gives us in being able to be rational and to understand things. But are we holy? No, we're not. And God isn't just holy, but he's holy. And he's holy. And it's just showing that he's so far removed from all the rest of creation and who he is, who his character is, and the fact that everything that he does is absolutely perfect. Holy, holy, holy. So it represents his independence. But on this side of the New Testament, we also understand this probably represents the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. God in perfection. God three in one. And he brings praises. So they bring praises to him. Holy, 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 who was and is and is to come. Now who is, it, 
who are they describing there? Particularly the Son, who was, right? So Jesus came to earth. He existed before that. He died. He rose again. He is. And He is to come. He's going to be returning one day. And they bring praise to Him. And verse 9 talks about when these creatures give praise to God, that we find that the elders are throwing their crowns down. Now look at verse 9. It says, Whenever the living creatures gives glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, it says, Then the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So whenever they sing the praises. When do they sing the praises? Night and day. There's no end to it, is it? And how long does God live? Forever. Eternity. So you see there, again, there's lots of symbolism here. So we have these elders that probably represent all of the redeemed from all time with these crowns of gold. You know, they're part of the royal family. But they've received these rewards from God. But now every time the angels are praising, it says they're throwing the crowns down. They're throwing down to the he who is eternal. So this crown, these elders, if they represent all of the redeemed, this is a, the reward of eternal life, certainly. These gold crowns upon them. But there's other crowns described throughout Scripture as rewards. You know, for what we do in the body, we receive rewards in that. But the ultimate reward is eternal life. And this crown, this word particularly, is usually used for the athletic crown and not the royal crown. But we see these are gold crowns. But it's the one who's run the race. It's the one who has overcome that we have discussed over and over again. Those are true believers. Those who have submitted to God. And here they are casting their crowns at his feet. You see, they're throwing the honor that God has given him at his feet. I am not worthy of what you've even given me. You are alone are worthy. See, they have the proper attitude. And that's what this is really representing. The proper attitude. They're submitting to God's authority. God there on the throne, casting crowns. And yes, that's where the Christian band Casting Crowns got their name from, this verse. They cast the crowns at his feet. In verse 11, uh, some theologians say that this is uh, the thesis or main point of chapter 4. And I would agree with that. It says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For, so here's the reason. Anytime you see for, it's really, look at what came before. Because this is a because. You, you deserve, you are worthy to receive this glory, honor, and power. Because, for, you created all things. You're absolutely worthy. And by your will, they exist and were created. God alone is worthy of all things. Is that not what God tells us over and over again throughout Scripture? But He gives us so much joy. He gives us so much in this earthly life as well, but in our heavenly life to come as well. God loves us so much. But all these things, all of creation, they're already His. He created them all. Everything is already His. And it says that by His will they exist and were created. You are not a mistake. God, in His perfect will, designed you. Unique individual. Unique person made in the image of God. Unique eternal person. By His will, you exist and were created. By God's will. It's a reason to praise Him. He's created all things. He's given us all things that are good. He's made us. And the Creator, the Creator is going to come to redeem His creation. And that's what Revelation, that's what we see unfold. Creator is coming to redeem His creation. And He is absolutely worthy to execute this plan of judgment and redemption over His creation. In chapter 5, we'll see the Lamb taking the scroll the Lamb that is worthy to execute this judgment. And again, He's worthy to execute redemption upon us as well. And you remember I said earlier that one point that we can take comfort in this chapter is the fact that God is in heaven and God is on His throne and He's in control. So even when your life seems like it is falling apart, running off the rails, and this world just seems absolutely crazy, God's got a purpose. 
God's got a plan. God knows the future. God has it all in His hands. And He is on His throne. And that is great comfort for us. And it's great comfort for us as we prepare to look at the unfolding of the judgment upon the wickedness of man. Upon creation. God is going to redeem His creation. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank You for Your, your Word tonight. And I thank you for the great hope that we have in you. And that no matter what's going on in the world, in our own lives, that we know that you are on the throne. That you have all authority and power. And you alone are deserve, deserving of our worship. And that these crowns that you give us, Lord, that we cast them at your feet in honor just submitting to you in all things. And I pray as we walk with you in this life on earth now, that we'd continue to honor you with the things that we speak, with the things that we do, with the things that we think, Lord. And help us to remember, too, that you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created, and that we are not an accident. We are not a random mutation, as the world wants to try to say. We are all special people created in the image of God and you have made us for a great purpose and you have brought us together today to be able to worship you and I just thank you for all that you give us Lord and again help us to rest in the peace that is in you alone in Jesus name I pray amen